So let's talk about how you eventually found the program. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you, like you said, you were seeking a lot of therapy, basically a lot of co coaches for this anxiety issue that you were having. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me your experience with that first, with sure. therapy and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, um, I reached out to a, uh, I've done like some therapy with several different therapists throughout my life, maybe for been like the last eight, 10 years. And um, a, a lot of the approach to tackle anxiety from them was around like cultivating like acceptance, like where you learn to just accept something as it is, which none of the things I'm going to mention are wrong. Like they're definitely in the right direction. And I don't want to like bash on my therapist because they really did care about me and my growth. Like they're very genuine, very kind people. And I also know a lot of people who have benefited from therapy, but um, uh, I was just in this place where like, you know, I would do like the acceptance training, acceptance training and I'd help a little bit, you know, I'd, um, I try to like cultivate mindfulness, which is a really good thing. Like I do things like journaling um, and which is also a good thing, but um, you know, the big thing I think they tried to get me to do is to like really lean into my anxiety and like expose myself intentionally mm -hmm. to like things that like actively cause me anxiety, like push back and disagree with my father and things like that, you know, um, and start generating momentum on that. Um, where I think I got stuck though was, is a lot of the things I was learning, I was trying to plant those seeds in my mind, like consciously. Mm. And I've kind of learned, you know, doing your program, like you are predominantly determined by your subconscious state, like 95% of it, like how you react, like especially. And um, I wasn't affecting my internal state, my subconscious mind. And so what would happen was, is I would do said thing, like, you know, approach my father or whatever. And that would cause a lot of anxiety. And like my old self, my old internal programming would take over because 95% of what you do is determined by your subconscious state. I would interpret that event in a bad way. It would cause me anxiety and my self esteem would actually decay as a result of doing that, making me feel more stuck and more anxious, Yeah, which is the opposite of what they were trying to get me to do. And I was, I think, you know, now that I think back, I think part of it was like, they had some tools, but I felt like I was never like really given any really effective processes that really turn the script on it or flip the script on it. Yeah. Especially yeah. like the subconscious deep component of it. And that's like where the most crucial shift was for me internally was being able to figure out how to affect that deep internal state. Yeah. So if we could summarize, yeah, and we're going to talk yeah. very deeply oh, about this can, later can, on. Can, so go ahead. Yeah. Mention one more thing. It's really important. For sure. Um, uh, I did a lot of like, talking through my anxiety and like what was causing it, what the source was, you know, we go back to like your relationship with your parents, all sorts of stuff. And it, it kind of like generated some victim mindset for me, like always pointing it at something else, you mm. know, and that didn't mm. help. And what happened was, is internally in my head, like this anxiety became so complicated, like so incomprehensible that it just became like this incomprehensible mass in my head. And I kind of just became kind of numb to it because I didn't know what to do. I felt stuck. Like I could never change it. Yeah. Yeah. I think if I could summarize yeah. the issues there and it kind of mirrors a lot of the issues that I've faced with therapy myself. And again, this is not to bash therapy, but this is maybe for people to understand what therapist to hire and what's a good therapist versus what's a maybe not the best. Um, number one is you need to understand the difference between what's necessary but not sufficient and necessary and sufficient. So all these things you're saying, like accepting where you are and leaning into where you are, like we teach all that stuff in the program. That's what we call SOC, where you just accept this true state of your being and how you got here and why you're here and what that feels like. But that alone is a necessary step. It's not sufficient to create that full transformation that you're looking for. It's like one out of the four steps kind of thing. Um, because from there, we realize like, okay, once we recognize it, we need to shift the emotions. We need to observe the shift. And that's the full spectrum. The second lesson is um, 
really using the wrong approach. So a lot of people, the way they approach changing emotions or optimizing emotions or working on emotions is again, um, they use a lot of tools like journaling, uh, like, like you said. But mm -hmm. the problem with journaling is that if you are journaling from the same victim mindsets, from the same tetheredness, from the same toxic paradigms that got you there in the first place, all you're doing is journaling about the same stuff that got you there in the first place. So for example, like if you tell a depressed person to journal, they're going to journal about how sad and miserable their life is. And journaling is not going to help them. It's going to make them more depressed. So we need to change the right thing, which is change your core paradigm, your core programming, your core beliefs. And once that happens, you can journal, you can do whatever you want, and you will find that you can succeed wherever you go. Now, the question becomes like, how do you change those subconscious programming? Again, a lot of people use what we call the striving approach to doing this, not the falling approach. And 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 so the, the striving approach is, you know, when you're trying to use your willpower to make something happen, right? So for example, like, if you're angry, tell yourself to not feel angry. Logically, that works. Yeah. But what you don't realize is when you tell yourself to not feel angry, you are creating a paradox where now you create the subconscious creates this thought where like, okay, consciously I'm telling myself, don't be angry. Subconsciously, you're accepting that you are angry and that subconsciously creates some issues. And we're going to talk about that too, where we call it like, uh, like the purple giraffe paradox or you call it, it's like the Chinese finger trap. The more you yeah. try to pull, the tighter it gets and the more you can't pull, right? Yeah. Um, and so if you are currently working on your emotional side, and I want you to ask yourself those, those three criteria there, right? D does your approach kind of fit and meet those three criteria? Because if it doesn't, then or if you're not sure, then you could be running faster in the wrong direction. And you could be like actually making thing, things worse for yourself for the long haul here. Um, anything you want to add to that before we kind of move on? I mean, I think, I think that captures it pretty well. Um, I was doing a lot, you know, a lot of the things you just mentioned and it, I just, um, you know, I noticed in myself, like, I mean, whether it's like anxiety, like I would try to like force myself to not feel anxious. And then somehow like miraculously, I would actually feel more anxious. Like, yeah. kind of like, like almost sleeping. like you tell yourself, like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to fucking do this. I got this, Nick, you got this, Nick, but like internally I haven't changed. So when the situation comes, nothing's really any different. Yeah. It's like sleeping again, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah. it's like, Telling yeah. it's like trying to sleep by telling yourself to fall asleep by forcing yourself to fall asleep. Yeah, logically, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, but in practice, it doesn't really work. It actually makes it harder for you to fall asleep. Same That's thing. Ex exactly what yeah. I experienced because like I used to struggle with insomnia, Jeffrey, and like, but one of the things that made the biggest difference was just like tell myself before I go to bed, just like you know, whatever happens happens, and stop pulling that Chinese finger trap, and you know I just fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when that it's it's amazing how it works. It's ironic. Yeah. 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 So you you said your therapist eventually told you, "Hey, you need to check out emotional safety. You need yeah. to cr create yeah. safety." Yeah. Um and then that was how you kind of stumbled upon my videos eventually. But it took you 9 months of watching my videos before you said like, "Okay, maybe I should try his program." Why 9 months? What what was happening in the nine months? What were you waiting for? What were you thinking about? Yeah. Um, you know, at first, Jeffrey, I thought like just kind of like cruising through your videos and getting a lot of good stuff from there, like help support what I was doing. And I made some commitments to my partner to like keep doing some, you know, some of that stuff and like that we were doing in counseling and all that stuff. And like we were given books and different programs and um um but uh, and yeah, so like I was just using it to supplement what I was doing and kind of grow some of my knowledge. And, you know, as I learned more and more, I kept piquing my interest, but, uh, um, 
it kind of seemed like, um, from my point of view, like when we were doing that work, like initially it seemed like it was helping, but then things started like to feel more tiring. It felt like we were, we thought we were getting anywhere or just getting, getting somewhere. And we realized we weren't getting anywhere. And we kind of come back to the same conversation that we were having nine months ago and just kept having the same conversations over and over again. And, um, eventually when things got hard enough, that's what flipped the switch in my mind that like, like something doesn't feel right. Like I got to do something different because like when, like if our relationship doesn't work out, like I'm going to internally be crushed and I didn't think I could handle it, honestly. Mm. So like the, the worst case scenario for me is I grow myself a lot and I really win from that. And that's still a good thing, but I didn't realize how far I'd go. Mm. Yeah. So, um, but, um, but you knew in your heart and your soul that, yeah safety was the right way to go like creating safety was the right way to go yeah but maybe so you had the right what but maybe you were questioning do i have the right how of how i'm creating safety and so exactly on. exactly like i i knew that that was the most important goal was to create safety and when i focused on doing that taking some of the the suggestions and seeds that you planted in my head from your videos like i did notice like that's when things really started to get better in our relationship was when I prioritized emotional safety. Um, but I just felt like there was so many things that I wasn't getting that was really preventing me from getting really creating that true sense of safety. And a lot of it was internal. And I knew that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, too, in order for us to fix the internal states, you have to see through a lot of the paradoxes behind that. And we yeah. already said one of the paradoxes before, which is that, to fix your internal state, you can't just will yourself to fix it. You actually have to play it smart and take the right approach because we're working with the subconscious here. But in a relationship too, you know, creating safety for your partner is a very falling thing. She needs to fall to trust. That's why they call it the trust fall. Yeah. And so in order for us to create safety, we can't just do the logical things that we think create safety. Yep. We need to play, understand how to talk to the subconscious, how to play the subconscious, how to not play, but how to influence and inspire your partner's subconscious too, right? And this paradox between the conscious and subconscious is why I think a lot of people, including yourself, you can understand what safety means, but you still cannot create it because you are taking on the logical approach of how you think it is to create safety, but not how it actually is because you're not playing the right game. You're not playing the right scoreboard of yep. appealing to the subconscious in a way. Yeah. See, that's a really good point. Cause um, you know, I'm like very cerebral <laughs> and I'm like, I, I would call that myself very cerebral. Like I like a big brain kind of person, like, like very obsessive, very logical. Right. And yeah. mega mind, mega mind. Yeah. And <laughs> it makes sense. Like, cause like I'm like a physicist at heart. So, um, but I wasn't really in touch with like my emotions and like people, like men in particular, I think like look at that as like a bad, like weak beta thing. But like, that was one of the most crucial shifts in your program was like actually taking the time to feel what I'm feeling, mm. understand my own depth inside of me, because that ended up becoming like the the catalyst to actually connecting with someone else just through my own experiences and being able to describe what that is in like such visceral detail. Yeah. Yeah. And um, um, I think maybe I'm getting off your question a little bit. Well, could you ask your question again? No, I think, I think the, the, so the other question I want to ask is also, so when you eventually decided, okay, maybe yeah. I should consider this program. How, I, I can sense there was a part of you that still couldn't trust me. Um, to help you with this. Mm -hmm. uh, before this this conversation, this interview was recorded, we talked about kind of like that, the, the topic of cre credentials, for example, how I didn't have credentials. Did that kind of stuff bother you? Yeah, a little bit. Because, um, you know, I mean, like, you know, like I think about like, you know, like my doctors and they all have like degrees, right? Like my heart doctor has 
you know, a long list of medical degrees that he used to get there, that, that, that he has, the experiences he's had and things he's had to go through to like qualify him to be able to like make decisions about people's hearts, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and like, like you didn't have that, like you're just some guy on the, you know, the, the YouTube that I've never <laughs> met before, you know? And you're just like this really interesting character. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, like that did kind of help hold me back a little bit, admittedly, you know? Cause, um, you know, like there's like my original thinking was like, you know, that credentials means a lot. And I'm not saying that it doesn't mean anything, but, um, that's kind of what was holding me back. And also just like not knowing fully, like what your program was really going to feel like, you know, mm. because uncertainty there, like I didn't know what the experience was truly going to be like. And, um, what really changed that for me was just like, trying so many things thinking they were the right things and then it feel like no matter what i did things kept getting harder and more exhausting and then like just had like one day where like there was a seed that you'd given me from your youtube channel about creating emotional safety you have a, a video about why like emotional safety is like the number one ingredient in relationships and and that inspired like some of the the way like i approached the couples counseling session and like my partner came back to me after that and that sense of message in my head, like, whoa, like this dude was right. Like, like, yeah. like I just felt like this feels right. Like this, there's something about this that's right. Yeah. And yeah. that created a lot of momentum after that. Yeah. 